a ride outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania town, where there is a campus, you can go to college there. Come on, show the altar. I'll stop when I can. Is this, is this going to be it? Yep, it's not the center of attention. There you go. So, so if you if you zoom in close, and I don't think I do, <laughs> you can see the uh, the altar, which looks like you know it's got the angels on the side and the 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 box, and it's all gold and stuff. Uh, and there's the biggest crowd I ever saw there. <laughs> Pretty neat place to visit, though. It's also a museum of religious artifacts. The, uh, the family that built this, the mansion next to it, um, uh, used to travel around the world and collect things like Egyptian mummies and statues and dead beetles and cool. religious things from all over the world. So if you're into religions, this is a neat place to go visit. Um, you do have to make an appointment. It's not like you could just barge in and decide to visit. Um, you can see like this, some of it, but you can't go in and get the tour. Uh, so, so you have to make sure that, because it's a small group thing, no more than I think 10. So you have to make, and, and they do charge. So there is a charge for that. The parking lot's free, but you have to pay to go in on the tour. But it's well worth it. $10 it was. Oh, last time I was there and uh, that's just kind of neat the church is separate you could just go into the church um, and I was impressed obviously uh, is that the only other one I actually took lots of videos there because there's Yes, that's what it, it, it looks just like the Ark of the Covenant. If you saw the picture that I, I made of the, um, the Ten Commandments, when you see my, um, my page, uh, it's the easiest way to get there. There. That's inside that building. That's that's the Ten Commandments, the two two uh, stones. So they're in Hebrew because they didn't have English yet you know, when Moses. But yeah, I took a picture of it. So all the folks that are trying to find where the tablets have ended up, well, there they are. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> so Emmanuel Swedenberg uh, by the way he was from Sweden <laughs> and no he never made it to the United States even though his church did so wasn't John Appleseed a member of or the person that was like inspired the stories about John Appleseed he was a member of the church of Swedenborg oh was he he weared a uh, pot on his head and carried the religious text of the Church of Swedenborg in that pot on his head. The actual pot. I had never heard of him. They give you the books for free, by the way. I have the whole collection. I went into the bookstore and the lady was so thrilled, you know, a oh, customer, you know, and, and so, you know, I wasn't going to buy anything, but she basically gave, here, take this, take this, take this. You know. So, somewhere in my garage, I have all of his books. Especially on the angels. He's very big on angels. So, that's pretty cool. Um, Louis Agassiz, uh, very famous. Um, still, um, Brent Athen. You could just look up Brent Athen, by the way. That's what I'm doing. I'm misspelling it, actually. So there's the outside of the cathedral. Um, they do have a college there. Um, you do not have to be a member of the church to go there, but they try their best to make you one while you're there if you do go there. Um, so that's kind of cool. 
Um, but it's a neat place. And that's one of the mansions. That's not the one that you go in for the tour, though. Um, okay. So that's cool. So his, his um, family was a member of that church. Um, and his book, The Varieties of the Religious Experience, that I mentioned is perhaps on sale still over there. Um, and, but it's silly because it's on, on the web. You don't have to buy it unless you want to have the physical copy so that you can scribble notes and stuff. Some people do. Um, but, and I have a couple copies somehow. Because back in the day, when I was your age, I didn't have the internet, so you had to buy books to do that. So that's how that worked. But what's the main thesis of the varieties of the religious experience? Well, he didn't actually physically go around the world the way Houston Smith does. If you're familiar with Houston Smith, Houston Smith is really cool. He writes about all the different world religions. I think it's this kind of... I don't know if he's still alive. What's it say? He died. 97, though. That's pretty impressive. But he used to go to all the different countries, and he made videos. You could watch watch his videos, and he goes and explains like Islam, uh, Buddhism, uh, Lao Tzu. You know, he, he does. What, one of the mo most impressive was when he's visiting the Buddhists, sitting around in a room, and they all start to do a chant. And then eventually it gets to the point where only one of them is left chanting, but you can hear all the voices from that one person. Really eerie. And that's that's just using a video of it. You know, I can imagine being in the actual room would be impressive. And I've heard that this is kind of a, a fairly common experience for people because uh, they do this all the time, apparently. Buddhist monks. So, so that's that's pretty cool. But the, the gist of it is that the varieties of the religious experience, the religious experience is a very important human experience. We all can share it, by the way. And there's contemporary work on this too. For example, um, why God will not go away. Um, So analyzing brains using um, uh, brain scans, MRIs, I guess. Um, you can actually see what the human brain does when it's having a religious experience. In this particular book, they examine, uh, he talks, I mean, they've done many studies since. This is, I guess, a fairly old book now, 2002. Um, but they scan a Buddhist monk and a Roman Catholic nun, both of them meditating inside the MRI. And what they discovered was the brain shuts down all the exterior sensory inputs so that it's just focused on this one part of the brain, which we all have, by the way. Uh, but in order for us to make use of it, we have to train ourselves. And by the way, every culture has a training program. They call it different things. But it all works the same way. The Roman Catholic nun prays on a rosary. The Buddhist monk uh, uses a mandala or something, you know. But but basically, what happens is you're focusing your attention narrower and narrower, so that your mind is totally ignoring all other inputs, and you end up then having the sense of being one with everything. And it's terrific by the way, when you have that experience. By the way, there are folks that are studying uh, psilocybin, so magic mushrooms. In fact, oh, yeah. if you check the paper today, uh, <laughs> there's an article, they're all frustrated in Oregon because they've made a law saying that the mushrooms are legal, but in order for you to use them, you have to have a center where you can go to have the experience. And in order to have the center, you have to have trained people who will guide you through the experience. And so even though that one lady is growing mushrooms, uh, magical 
fungi. Um, uh, you can't actually have the experience yet because none of the centers have been instituted yet, and they did just uh, license 100 people to be licensed practitioners at these centers. But so it'll still be a month or two before you can actually go and have these legal experiences with magic mushrooms, right? Well, where are um, they are licensed. Yeah. Pardon? And what they have to do to, to earn the license? They had to go to a training program. They went through a training program. So, uh, the mushroom uh, same people you can train to get people ketamine. It's the scent. It's not really the same thing. No, but I mean, I. Yeah, but it, ketamine makes you trip. Magic mushrooms make you trip. There are a lot of things in medicine that make you trip and that are extremely valuable. So. This is another one that's talking about it, the science of psychedelics. I've seen that. Michael Pollan, he's been out. Um, he, in the book, he describes trying three different things. The mushrooms is the one, the, um, uh, the one from the south uh, west. Uh, peyote? Peyote? Yeah. Isn't that the thing from the frog? No. That's, and that's the other one. That's the thing so the there's three. So there's three that he, he used with a professional, and he highly recommends you know do this with a professional, but all of them basically guide you through a particular experience, and it kind of uh, um, chemically helps you experience the same kind of thing that lots of training in various religions enables you to do without the chemicals. So so it's so it's a a. a part of the brain that really only functions when you're trained to use it or you have some other way of, of, of doing it. These ways I think are, are more dangerous. Obviously if you take the training uh, and become you know, capable, monks you know, are, are just absolutely amazing because they could actually, while you're watching them in the MRI, they can focus on a particular part of the brain and just run that brain part and stuff and you can kind of shut the other part down. So, so, the, so the goal of course here is, is that these religious experiences are shared worldwide, culture, you know, interculturally. Every culture has them. Not everybody in every culture gets to experience it though because you have to be part of the established religious group that, that trains you to have that experience. But so the point of this is that religion as an experience is a very important aspect. And what does it especially do for us, says William James? It enables you to realize that, that there's more to you uh, or, the, or that you're part of the larger world. You're, you can be connected to that larger world. I think I summarized that pretty well. But... Yes. So you keep saying it's like a religious experience. I feel like there's plenty of people that meditate that aren't religious. Like, I feel like it's. That's true. That's true. Um, no, I, it's funny. I have a lot of friends that hate the word religion. I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> and then they talk about using their language in a way that essentially is the same as what I'm trying to say with the word religion. So, so. You know, if I were to go with Charles Sanders' purse and see how the language functions, you're using a different utterance to refer to the same physical experience. And that's not a conflict. You know, you just, oh, you don't like the word religion. Okay. Well, there's good reason for it. You know, religion bothers the heck out of a lot of people because of, you know, all the things associated with the various religious institutions, which are man-made, and you know, whenever you go to an institution that's man-made, there are people there, <laughs> and people screw the dang thing up, like you know we usually do in practically anything we get involved with. Uh, so you know, yes, of course, you know, be embarrassing, you know, uh, and yet at the same time, you know, the overall, hopefully, effort on the part of what created the institution, etc. I mean, when I think of um, St. Francis of Assisi. You think, wow, what a, a holy person and that, you know, all the intentions and the peace and all that love, love the animals, you know, all that stuff. Then you read about the actual guy and you're horrified because, man, what a 
sicko. You know? <laughs> King famous. And, and the good parts are what people continue on with, but, but beating your body up, you know, so that you're like trying to hit practically a skeleton, nah, that's not interested in that kind of stuff. No. So, okay. What else do I have? So, Charles Sanders Purse, highly recommend him if you're interested. By the way, one of the professors here who was in our philosophy department, uh, James Lishka, was a specialist on Charles Sanders Purse and wrote several books on him. Uh, and that's, that's kind of cool. He re retired from being the dean here and then went on to be the provost at SUNY uh, in New York, the State University of New York in, I forget which campus, the one up near Buffalo. Um, and he's still there, but in any case, he's only a month older than me or so. That's pretty neat. Um, so Charles Sanders Purse. Uh, Josiah Royce was the first homegrown philosopher uh, that was trained in the United States. Um, actually, I'm not sure about Charles Sanders Purse. But Josiah Royce studied in college in um, 